Right, we've come along the borders of uh, France and Luxembourg and uh, I'll come along to look at a part of the Maginot Line. A bit of history of the Maginot Line, built in the between the late, the late 20s and early 30s, it was commissioned or approved by the then Minister of War, André Maginot. Uh, the reason they built this, uh, this, uh, these fortifications because they feared that uh, after the Treaty of Versailles, with uh, the Allies and and uh, Germany, the Germans thought that it was very unfair that uh, the conditions of the treaty basically blamed Germans for everything. <coughs> and a lot of discontent in that time. And the population of uh, France was something like 30 to 40 million, where the Germans were 70 million, and the French government thought that they wouldn't uh, stand a chance against them unless they did some kind of fortification. Hence the Maginot Line. So the Maginot Line is about uh, 943 miles long. Um, it runs along the border of uh, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Luxembourg, then starts to pit out of it going towards Belgium. It's mixed. Uh, it's a mix of fortifications. It's um, they have what they call petit ouvrage and gros ouvrage, which is basically small strong points and large strong points. Uh, these strong points are a mixture of um, machine guns, larger guns, um, cloches, which are bells with on top of these of structures, uh, and at front of them they tend to have. Um, minefields or certain sections of this um, uh, this line had, uh, could, uh, the, the fields and that could be flooded just to stop the Germans from coming and attacking them basically and also they had some metal girders in the floors as well which um, uh, anti-tank anti-tank guns as well um, or anti-tank um, traps to stop them from obviously attacking with tanks and stuff like that now, each fortification had um, a smaller fortification had between one and two hundred men, I think, um, man in it, and the large ones had up to, up to a thousand men manning these um, these lines. Uh, a lot of these fortifications could actually fire on each other, and it sounds a bit strange that when I just said that. But what happens is, if, for instance, one of these fortifications had been attacked by the Germans, then the other fortification could actually fire on fire at it or fire at the enemy. And uh, the soldiers inside the, the Maginot line would, would, uh, should be safe in the fact that they're actually safe by their own guns firing at them, but at least they've got this crossfire. They can protect each other. Um, some of these, um, quite a few of these um, overages are actually um, they're designed to, to make the enemy go into a certain area. Uh, what they call a killing zone. In other words, they, they, they sort of push them into a certain area so they can actually attack them and hopefully they wipe them out and stop them from advancing. Now, really strange this because in, in when they first designed this, this the Maginot Line, they actually designed it uh, so it would be weaker around the um, Belgian area because the idea was that the Germans would hopefully think that uh, this fortification was too strong to sort of go through it so they go around it and that was the plan for the Belgian uh, for the uh, French as well um, the Germans tried to do that in the First World War and it was called a Schlieffen plan uh, where they go through Belgium go around the back of, of France and um, attack it round the back uh, fortunately the BEF which is the British Expeditionary Force stopped them in Ypres and was there for over four years that was the First World War Second World War the um, Germans, sorry, the French didn't anticipate uh, the Germans coming through the Ardennes. Now, when you look at the Ardennes, it's very, very thick woodland, 
and the French deemed it that it would be it was difficult to actually get through the actual uh, den itself, so they didn't even fort fort fortify that section or made it weak. But the Germans developed a thing called the um, Blitzkrieg, which is the Lightning War. They came through the Ardennes, went through Belgium, right around the back of, um, of France, and, and attacked this position round the back of uh, round its back because that was the weakest. That was its weakest spot. Also, um, they ended up um, annexing the uh, British Expeditionary Force and the French in a place called Dunkirk. And uh, a lot of them, 338,000 men were rescued, I think it was that, uh, on the beach of Dunkirk called Operation Dynamo. But that's another story. So anyway, we're at a place called uh, Gros Ouvrage Latrimont. It lies between uh, two other fortifi fortified sections of the Maginot Line. One's called the Petit Mavis of Wah. I think I pronounced it, and the other one's uh, Gross Overage for Mont. This bit here, uh, where you can see behind me, it's um, it's it's crew entrances. Now the other one to the right hand side of me is where the uh, 60 centimetre railway was, and that's where they brought all the ammunition and all the goods and stuff like that. This Overage was manned by 580 men and 21 officers, and it was called the 149th Fortress Regiment. Latchmont was active from 1939 to 1940, it came under direct uh, attack from the Germans in June of 1940. Latremont tried to defend itself against the Germans. Uh, it fired over 14,500 mm shells and over 4,081 mm shells. By June 1940, the Germans had brought up 21 cm howitzers and also mortars and fired directly on these uh, positions. Um, eventually, the Germans went round the back of, um, of this fortification and the others and cut all power supply and lines to it. By the 27th of June 1940, Latremont surrendered to the Germans. Right, I'm on top of the fort now. That looks like uh, that's a cloche, non rotatable. It's quite possibly a machine gun nest. The two lugs, the lug there and the lug there, um, that's so they can take the, um, this bell off if they needed to. This here has got a hole in it, so I wouldn't be surprised this was probably a periscope of some kind. That's a long way down. Two more bells or uh, cloches, as the Germans, uh, as the French called them. Lucy saw there for uh, possibly machine gun nests. This is the other entrance. Um, these are two together. Now the uh, this one would have been for. Um, you can see there's a there's a road here, so this would have been for putting like ammunition and um, and trucks and vehicles and stuff like that into this one, because the doors widen the other one. That would have come open and uh, they'd have got them in that way. More protective crinelles. See how they step back now from the um, the First World War were quite smooth on the crinelles they had on, for instance, Dumont. But here they step back, and the reason that is is because uh, if a, a bullet or a shell hits it, theoretically it should bounce out, or not actually bounce into the actual holes themselves where the, the guns are. Yeah, crinelles for French, loopholes for English. Embrasures for the Germans. Looks like there's a way in here, so I'm going to squeeze in and have a look round. Now, this gross overage is over a hundred foot deep and a mile in, so I'll see how far I get. Uh, whether I go that far or not, I'm on my own. Um, I don't like taking that many risks, but uh, let's have a look round and see what uh, we can find inside here.
you can see the railway lines here. It's running all the way in, taking goods and uh, ammunition straight into that area there. There's more machine gun nests here. Very similar to the Germans, actually, in their bunkers. There you go. This is uh, one of the crinelles from the inside. Very echoey. And that's up to a cloche. Up above, if you look up there, that's where the machine gun would have been. Or, or a man would have been mounting it with a machine gun or in maybe observation. Some uh, conduiting cable. There you are. There's ventilation shafts, these. I think they had to be low ground level. There you go. Absolutely fascinating. There's the uh, the other side of the Crenell where the machine would have been. More steps going down to the basement. And this here, again, is to the uh, cloche at the top. Some kind of storeroom this is. Yeah, over the time, it's rotted away, the, the door. This is some kind of a, uh, maybe, drawbridge of such to make, um, to give it some more protection. There's the handle where it would have been cranked, and there's the chain to pull whatever across. Oh my, it still works. Brilliant. 70 years old and it's still working. Right, let's uh, walk a little bit deeper into this um, this building. Overhead gantries. Obviously to uh, either take off the goods or to load goods on. Ooh. Right, uh, there's water down there, see ya. I'm going to have to be really careful here because there's lots of little places that uh, you can get trapped. Engine as such that the, the, the motor would have been to lift the, uh, the cranes up and down where they took the goods off the, uh, the rails, the railway carriages. Oh, that's proper stuck, that is. I'm going to have to squeeze through there, I think. And there's a lift shaft. And no doubt it goes down a good few feet here. Have a look. I'll try and show you. That's a fair way down, that is. Yep, another lift shaft. That's um, actually on this level. The other ones, I think, it's gone right down the bottom. There's some steps there as well. So we'll have to go and venture a little bit lower, I think. This one as well has got railway lines in it, <coughs> and it's got some kind of um, support there that the um, that one of the um, carriages can go on, so we can drop it down to a lower level.
That's a fair way of doing that, is. These steps are okay so far. Right, and as far as the stirs will take me, have you noticed there? Full of water. So I've got to be really, really careful here. Water there, and uh, oh, you can see the tunnel down there that lead to one of the um, offshoots. And there's water running there, you see it. There we go, right? Let's walk down here, see what uh, we can find down this little tunnel. More water. I don't think we find anything down here actually. Have a look so I don't fall in. That's the main thing. <coughs> Goes on a bit. Must be an end. It goes on and on and on that. I've not a clue where it ends that thing. I think it's just pipe work. I think it's just a, a little uh, tunnel for pipe work. I can't see an end to it. <clears throat> you see some of the carriage that's been left. And water log down there as well, and some more. I don't know if it's a walk down there, I don't know if it's safe or not. Some of the old fashioned um, cables that would be more likely lighting and stuff like that. Let's have a look. I knew there'd be water down here, that's why I brought my wellies. I want to make sure that um, I don't sink in anything. I don't want somebody to just go plunging in uh, <coughs> water and the, uh, well, you don't want that down here on your own. You need really good torches to come down places like this because otherwise you can't see nothing. There's another uh, machine gun point and another one. Quite a few of them, isn't there? Wow, that's a pretty big corridor down there. Full of water. <sighs> Full of water. Hmm. I'll walk a bit further. This um, overage uh, was manned by 642 men, I think it were. It had 21 officers in it as well. Let's see what this is. More ventilation shafts. Somebody's had a fire here. Why would you have a fire here? Uh, I was talking to a, uh, an English lad yesterday who's into stuff like this. He said, uh, you can't tell what this was because there's nothing here that uh, gives you an indication what it was. 
I'll have a look on the plan after and I'll um, let you know what I think it is. And um, the other thing I don't want to think is overages. And um, I think with the camping outfit night and unbeknown to him, it's very similar to having a barbecue in your tent. And uh, they all died. Which is not very good, is it? <coughs> Little passages off everywhere. More buildings, more storage area. Big thick doors to uh, protect them from uh, attack. Interesting place though, you see the lines, the, the uh, railway lines run along. Well, they're probably just the same as the ones I've just been on the left hand side, on the right hand side. Very interesting. I just wish I had somebody with me, really. I'd feel safer then. Yep, same as. Like storage. Put a bit stuff on. That's what storage is, isn't it? Right, what's this here? It's some kind of big tank. Actually, you probably can't see it very well. But I think it's a water storage tank. Fresh water, that's a guess. <coughs> mm, see, I missed going into it. That's not very good. More water, and it curves off there. And the tunnel goes further down there. Now I've come across this section here, it's a couple of inches of water in it. Uh, it's a platform that be for unloading and loading goods onto the wagons. Be carefully because uh, I don't know what's underneath this floor. What a storage area. This might take water here anyway. Yeah, big massive, uh, there you are, a gantry, loading and loading stuff. More storage. There's another, uh, oh, it's like a, an electrical a box. Well, the knobs on it, or oh, a knob on it, I should say. Yeah, it's more than likely an electrical box, and yeah. Another gantry, taking uh, or picking goods and that up and dropping them off. Well, look, I've just walked down here because obviously yeah, it's a platform and there's uh, the old railway lines or the remnants of them anyway. Um, it's obviously been bringing stuff from uh, outside into here and storing it. This must be a storage area, whether it's um, 
ammunition, orange food, or essentials, whatever it may be. But uh, that looks as though that's what this area is. That's what this stirs leaders. Actually, no work, to be honest with you. Um, it's just below ground. Ah, there we go. It's a toilet. When a man wants to go, a man must go. Watch where I'm walking here. About two inches deep, but. There's a roller shutter just to keep uh, people out. I'll keep people in, whichever you look at it. Interesting indeed. Metal gates. I wonder if it's a guardhouse of some kind. It isn't. I think it's a. Oh, there it is. I think it's that water tank. I think it is. I've walked further than I think, actually. I think I've done about half of it, but I guess. So that concludes the tour of um, Gross of Rise of Atremont. I think I've done probably half of it. Um, the water and the, the air quality seems to be getting worse, so I'm not going to put it any further because obviously they had, uh, they had air conditioning, sorry, they had um, air ventilation filters in here at one time it was running. This is a 100 foot down by about a mile in, about um, 30 metres down by roughly about 50 or metres long, so uh, I'm not prepared to, on me, I'm not prepared to go any further. Uh, I've seen quite a bit anyway, and hopefully I've, uh, I've informed you on certain things. Well, at least you've seen stuff that I've seen, and you can go down and do some research on it. I will leave some links about uh, the um, uh, National Line, you can have a look yourself. Right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again.